Gracious God, by your spirit, we pray that you make your presence known in this space and in these texts, that they may become your living word, and that we might become your living witnesses. To this end, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our scripture lesson is coming from a fairly famous parable in Luke's gospel, the parable of the prodigal son. And so I'm going to invite you to hear Luke 15, 1 through 3, and then we're going to skip the parable of the lost sheep and then read 11 through 32. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. Then Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout the country. And he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would have gladly filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. And then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. Now, his elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves, asked what was going on, and he replied, Your brother has come home, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he got him back safe and sound. And then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you've never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because the brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Every time I heard this passage growing up, it always seemed to be interpreted through a personal lens, a personal piety, an idea that somehow we had to fit ourselves into this story and figure out how to act right, even though no one does but the Father in this story. Some of the sermons would call us to not be like the younger brother. Don't waste the gifts that God has given you. 
The warning came not to be like the younger son and waste that all God had given. Other sermons would invite the hearer to decide which one of the brothers they were more like. Maybe you've heard a sermon like that. And still other sermons would remind us that we're all like the younger brother. That we all are in need of accepting God's grace and that God would forgive us. And none of those sermons are wrong, especially since I know I've preached a few of them on this <laughs> message. So, of course, they couldn't have been all wrong. It's that, in some ways, by doing that with this passage, we narrow it down too far and miss some important lessons. They ignore the setting of which it was preached. We have to go back to the reason why Jesus told this story to begin with, to begin to figure out what message we ought to glean from it. Not just one, there are many. But we cannot narrow it down simply to personal decisions. This isn't just a story about me and Jesus. Jesus tells this story because the religious leaderships, the religious leadership and other religious good rule-following folk were angry that he had been eating with tax collectors and sinners. And the important thing about that line is that that was the kind of thing that could get Jesus stoned, killed. So it was an indictment that they were dropping on Jesus. If he's really a religious teacher, he would know what kind of people these are and you don't hang out with them. And so instead of arguing with him, instead of throwing one text after another, he tells a story and it seems they have nothing to say afterward. Because he tells the parable after this. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. Whatever he had to say, the folks who were excluded from the religious community were the ones who were hungry for this message of welcome and inclusion. And then they say this. This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. Eating with them meant that you saw them as welcome and included and part. And this is the message Jesus was always getting in trouble for. It is safe to assume, looking at this story, that the older brother is representative of the scribes and the Pharisees. They had spent their lives studying and working and trying to follow the rules because God said, you should do these things. And they had done them faithfully. And then the younger brother obviously has to represent the tax collectors and the sinners. Now once we know that, and I think we do, we can then begin to talk about where we put ourselves into the story, and then we can focus on a few other things. But the most important thing, I think, about this passage is one simple reality. Jesus calls them brothers. In other words... What Jesus is doing, it's not about whether or not, did the son have to come back before God acts? Does God offer forgiveness before we do? Because that's what we do with this passage. You ever notice that, right? I don't, I don't know. I, I grew up in a little bit more evangelical background. What they said is, you have to take the first step before God's willing to forgive you. Now, in the Reformed tradition, we have the cross, and that's pretty much taken care of. Um, we, don't, we don't have to rely on our own actions for God's grace. But that's the kind of thing we focused on. What we missed was this idea that what Jesus was saying was that the tax collectors and the sinners and the scribes and the Pharisees were all part of the same family. And if they heard that, they had to be really angry. Jesus takes this us and them mentality of religious folks and turns it upside down. Those people who you see as other are part of your family, like it or not. I'll say that again. Anytime you identify those who are the other, I know generally liberal, welcoming folks like to think that we're not, you know, we welcome all people. We're not like those folks over there, though, who don't welcome all those people, right? What this passage is saying is, like it or not, part of the same family, and that is what Jesus is getting at. So last year, about this time, actually it was, uh, I think it was the 14th, 15th of February, New York Times columnist David Brooks wrote an article, and I've never quoted him before, but this is a particular article that I think is well worth our energy after I pick at him a little bit. 
He wrote an article called Prodigal Sons, in the plural. And I think it's one of the best examples of anyone who I've ever read in the church or out who understood the one simple reality that at the heart of this passage is the issue of relationships, the idea that we're all in it together. Now, I do think he pushed the text a little too far because he compares the middle and upper class in the United States with the older brother. Now, the problem with that is that you get to this idea that somehow the old, the, today, that the middle and the upper class are somehow there because they've just done it on their own. Remember, that older brother got his money the old-fashioned way. He inherited it. And then he takes in this passage the younger brother and equates them with the poor in the United States. Now the problem is, is that that then reinforces the myth that poor people put themselves there and they're to blame. And I know and we know otherwise that not to be the case. So likewise, he reinforces this naive idea that those with money are just naturally more industrious and hardworking in this particular article. Despite that, despite the number of ways in which his interpretation falls short, he gets the most important thing right, which is, we are all in this together. Whoever the other is, is our brother. Wherever we find or want to put ourselves in this story, it doesn't matter, we're all related. And what that means is, and Brooks went on to say, is we can't leave anyone out. No one. No one can be left out in our society. Otherwise, we're all prodigals. And on that, I'll give him all the credit. He got attacked by a lot of folks, you might imagine, on that one. No one can be left out. Not the younger brother, not the older brother. Everyone. And the older brother was the one who actually had the most trouble with this idea of relationship. Not just with his brother, but with his own father. Did you notice this? When he goes to his father and complains, he refuses to be part of the joyous feast. He chooses to stand outside the welcoming banquet of God. And then says, why didn't I get a goat to go party with my friends? Not, why didn't I get a feast to party with all of you? So he, in his own way, has also turned his back on his father. Which, by the end of the story, why we can say there isn't a prodigal son, there are prodigal sons and prodigal people. And that's just what the older brother, the Pharisees and the scribes, the good religious folks can't quite handle, that everyone is going to be included. After all, we've been raised on a rich diet of what goes around comes around, or you will get what's coming to you, or the Lord helps those who help themselves, said nowhere in the Bible. And I'm sure you can add your own. But those kinds of things that the older brothers of our world and of our lives and in our hearts like to say, people often just get what's coming to them. But we know those are not the values of God. We don't get what we deserve. And for that, most of us, we ought to be really thankful. That is the good news. God offers forgiveness and new life and the hope of transformation. It is a message of joy and hope, and it ought to fill us with gratitude. And like that younger brother, when we find ourselves incapable of offering that kind of generosity to whoever the other is, we have to remember that it is in the moment when the son comes to himself, remembers whose he is, that everything changes. And that should lead us to share the same sort of love and gratitude to all people. Not just hoard it for ourselves. Otherwise, if we don't, we will be the ones on the outside looking in.